This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. States President George Bush said that the way in which the nuclear issue in North Korea was resolved can be used as a model to resolve the conflict with Iran. Bush gave a speech at the Chamber of Commerce in Pennsylvania saying that leading countries must continue to exert pressure on Iran just like they did with North Korea in order for Iran to give up its nuclear ambitions. Bush renewed the American offer to negotiate with Tehran if it agrees to suspend its uranium enrichment program. The American president's comments gave those countries trying to mediate between the United States and Tehran new ideas in order to reach a political agreement with Tehran. The international community is trying to convince the Iranians to stop their uranium enrichment program, but Iran has refused to comply with their demands on several occasions. Iran and North Korea have always used military parades and training exercises as a way to flex their muscles in response to international sanctions. In 2002, the U.S. labeled Baghdad, Tehran, and Pyongyang as the axes of evil. The U.S. administration dealt with Iraq by invading Baghdad while it reached an agreement with Pyongyang. North Korea and the U.S. agreed that North Korea would receive large amounts of financial aid and be allowed to resume diplomatic relations with Western countries as long as they dismantled their nuclear reactors. Washington has not yet resolved its problems with Iran. So far, the U.S. and its Western allies are stressing that there must be a diplomatic solution even if they have to be accompanied with sanctions imposed by the United Nations Security Council. America's primary condition to reaching a diplomatic solution is that Iran agrees to hold all of its uranium enrichment programs, including the civilian ones. It would be an important development if the U.S. were to reach a similar agreement with Iran to that which it reached with North Korea. U.S. officials say that Iran's geographical location and political system are different from those in North Korea. Eighteen months ago, Tehran rejected the U.S. offer, which was was similar to the one that was made to Pyongyang. The offer included economic and technical incentives in return for halting their uranium enrichment programs. Russia also made an offer to host Iran's uranium enrichment programs. The International Atomic Energy Agency has held talks with the Iranian officials about possible solutions, but so far no solution has been reached. Walid Saliba Al Arabiya. The British Telegraph newspaper reported that Iran has been providing the Taliban with bombs and military equipment similar to the ones it has been giving to the Iraqi rebels. According to the newspaper, more than 50 shipments of bombs and military equipment were discovered as they were trying to cross the Iranian border. It is believed that the bombs were intended to be used for planting explosives in Afghanistan. We start in Washington, where the head of the Future Bloc in Parliament, MP Saad Al Hariri, is scheduled to meet U.S. President George W. Bush this afternoon. The White House had earlier announced that Bush and Hariri will most likely discuss the upcoming presidential elections, as well as the U.N. tribunal investigating the assassination of former Premier Rafiq Al Hariri. On his first day in Washington, Hariri discussed the Lebanese file with a number of U.S. congressmen. Mefawaz reports. The head of the Future Bloc in Parliament, MP Saad Al Hariri, meets today U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice ahead of talks with U.S. President George W. Bush, scheduled for the afternoon. U.S. National Security Spokesman Gordon John Drove said he expects Bush and Hariri to discuss the U.N. Special Tribunal investigating the assassination of former Premier Rafi Hariri. He said the United States expects Syria to cooperate in this investigation and to cease its interference in Lebanon's domestic affairs. 
According to John Dro, the two leaders are also expected to discuss Lebanon's upcoming presidential elections and that the United States would work hand in hand with a freely elected president. He also said that Bush and Hariri will likely discuss continued American support for the Lebanese government as it further builds the capacity of the Lebanese armed forces to confront challenges to stability in Lebanon and the region. Hariri, who arrived in Washington on Wednesday, met consecutively with Senator John Kerry and the Democrats' majority leader in the House of Representatives, as well as the head of the Republican majority in the Senate. Hariri also met a number of congressmen, including Lebanese Nick Rahal, Ray Lahoud, and John Snunu. Hariri closed his talks yesterday with an iftar held in his honor by Lebanese ambassador to the U.S., Antoine Shdid. The head of the Future Bloc said his visit to Washington was aimed at thanking the U.S. administration for its financial help for Lebanon and asking for its support in stopping foreign interference in its internal affairs. He said he explained to American congressmen the continued Syrian attempts to meddle in Lebanon's internal affairs. It's important that uh, the region is passing through a very hard time, uh, very hard uh, decisions uh, had, had been taken and hopefully will be taken. Uh, we're looking forward for a new president in Lebanon uh, that has, uh, has the will of the 14th of March, that is from the 14th of March, and we will continue working with all our allies uh, to come uh, to peace in Lebanon and to help uh, the Lebanese people everywhere they are. The Committee of Families of Lebanese Prisoners in Syria held a press conference in the Garden of Gibran Khalil Gibran in central Beirut to discuss the latest developments regarding their missing relatives. At the time, they also announced that the Lebanese-Syrian Joint Commission failed in this regard. For the past two years, the families of Lebanese prisoners in Syria have staged sit-ins in front of the UN headquarters in Beirut. However, the Lebanese government has not given them any information regarding the fate of their missing relatives. A delegation representing the families of Lebanese prisoners in Syria visited Geneva, where they met with the UN Commission Against Torture. The head of the Lebanese delegation, Rami Saliba, said a list of 640 missing cases was presented before the UN Human Rights Council, which will review the cases in a special session next November. He also confirmed that the International Red Cross offered to help with the nuclear acid testing, provided that the Lebanese government put in a request. From our visit to Geneva, it was clear that the Lebanese authority has been negligent at every level, especially when it comes to the cases of the missing persons. The efforts exerted by this institution do not relieve the Lebanese government from its duty to find a permanent solution to this problem at the national and international levels. The deteriorating security situation in Lebanon has a negative impact on domestic issues including the cases of the missing persons. The Lebanese Commission believes that the solution to this problem is through the creation of an international tribunal that will examine the cases of Lebanese prisoners in Syrian jails. It also announced that it will continue to hold sit-ins to remind the Lebanese government and officials as well as the presidential candidates of the case. Benazir Bhutto, leader of the People's Party and former Prime Minister, expressed her optimism for reaching a power-sharing agreement with Pakistani President Pervez Musharraf. This came after Bhutto met with leading officials in her party in London, where she told reporters that she expects resolving the remaining obstacles in the agreement, but that nothing is yet complete. She confirmed that her party members will not withdraw from the parliament if no agreement is reached with Musharraf. She renewed her invitation to Musharraf to step down from being head of the army, saying that members of her party will not support a military chief. The Pakistani presidential elections will be held next Saturday. The opposition, however, has boycotted the elections after its parliamentarians resigned. The president is elected by the Senate, the National Assembly, and the provincial assemblies.
في حال تمكن الرئيس الباكستاني برفيز مشرف من الفوز في الانتخابات If the Pakistani president Pervez Musharraf was able to win the presidential elections and complete the next five-year term, then he will be the first president to rule Pakistan for such a long period since its independence. The presidential elections will take place with the opposition boycotting them amidst unprecedented political and legal fury. You know, it all depends on the Supreme Court decision. The future scenario depends on the Supreme Court and whether it will allow General Musharraf to participate in the elections while still serving as the head of the military. The president is chosen by the Electoral College, which includes the Senate, which has 100 members, and the National Assembly, which has 332 members, including 60 women and 10 non-Muslim minority representatives, in addition to more than 728 members, comprising the provincial assemblies. Thus, the success of the president depends on his ability to make alliances under the roof of the parliament. نجاح الرئيس مرهون بقدرته على نسج التحالفات والعلاقات تحت قبة البرلمانات. The resignation of the opposition from the national and provincial assemblies forced Musharraf to make compromises with the People's Party in order to win the elections. He has been pressurized. According, according to some to people, some Musharraf has been pressured by the United States to give up certain things in favor of Bhutto, who is speaking the language that the United States wants to hear. She will allow the Americans to launch military raids in the Pakistani territories. The president, who still has the authority to dismiss the chief of the military and the prime minister, will not be just a figurehead. This might have convinced Musharraf's allies, who are ideologically at odds with the People's Party, to remain loyal to him. This is the first time the same parliament members elect the same president for two consecutive terms causing much disagreement among opposing parties and legal institutions. Ahmad Zaydan, Al Jazeera, Islamabad. In the refugee camps in Lebanon, fighting erupted between members from Fatah and Hamas in the Mia Mia camp near Sidon in southern Lebanon. One Fatah member was injured before the fighting was contained and peace returned to the camp. Parliamentary Majority Leader Saad al-Hariri plans to ask for additional aid for the Lebanese Army and Security Forces in a meeting today with the U.S. President George Bush at the White House. The meeting will focus on the Lebanese elections and the special international tribunal trying the perpetrators of Rafiq al-Hariri's assassination. Amidst the political and security tensions in Lebanon, some people silently expressed their anger and frustration. Yesterday in Beirut, 3,000 people wearing white shirts and carrying candles marched toward the parliament square in complete silence to express their condemnation of the political assaults. Alia Ibrahim reports from Beirut. In the past three years, Lebanon has been deeply shaken with ten assassination attempts, some of which succeeded and some of which failed, as well as multiple explosions. The last of these explosions resulted in the assassination of parliament member Antoine Ghanem, a tragedy that is still affecting more than 300 suffering families. They only allowed us into our homes to start fixing things today. As you see, we once had a home but came out without one, not to mention 80 stitches. But all this is easier to handle than the loss of a loved one. Charles Shahani was an ambitious and successful young man, a son, a brother and a friend who chose to return to Lebanon to live, but his fate was to die on the sidelines of the latest assassination.
Charles escaped, but then he regained his courage and returned because he believed in this country and wanted to live happily among his friends and family. He returned to give back to his country, but it did not give him anything in return. Charles' story of being attached to Lebanon, leaving and returning, is a story that is repeated in many homes in this country that loses its youth on a daily basis. The government, through the municipality of tourism, found it important to broadcast this advertisement to encourage those living away to return, even if only for a short visit. The family and friends of Charles Shahani and others who did not know him wanted to give homage to this young man and what he represented, so they walked wearing white shirts in a candle vigil in the heart of Beirut. With every explosion or assassination, the Lebanese people become increasingly aware of their country's frail condition, and with every story similar to Charles Shahani's, they become aware of their vulnerable security, livelihood, life and dreams. They question the price they have to pay and for how long. Aliyah Ibrahim, Dubai TV, Beirut. The United Nations Security Council resolution condemning the attack on the African Union forces in Sudan did not only come too late, but also failed to openly criticize the rebel movements behind it. After a long wait, the UN Security Council issued a resolution condemning what it described as an ugly attack on the headquarters of the African Union peacekeeping force in Haskanita in southeastern Darfur. More than 10 African Union soldiers were killed and 10 others were wounded. The UN resolution calls on peacekeeping forces to exert their efforts to identify the perpetrators and punish them. It seems that the international community has unanimously condemned the heinous attack on the African Union peacekeeping base in Haskanita. On the day of the attack, we the Sudan condemned the attack and called for the arrest and conviction of those responsible. Despite the strong evidence linking some dissented armed groups to the attack, the UN resolution failed to implicate them. Meanwhile, the Russian ambassador to the UN described the resolution as weak and told reporters that certain UN members find it hard to blame the rebel groups in Darfur. According to observers, the resolution indicates a shift in the way the UN has been dealing with rebel movements in the Sudan. Some believe this shift was a result of the ongoing diplomatic efforts exerted by the Sudanese government. This disaster would not have happened if the international community met its obligation by providing logistical and technical support to the African Union. Without help, the African Union will not be able to protect its troops in the event that they come under attack. The African Union force is not required to work under the Articles of Chapter 7 because self-defense is a legitimate right mandated by international laws. The attack on the African Union base, which comes just three weeks ahead of the Tripoli Peace Conference, has raised several issues. It also tells us that expectations of the Tripoli Conference will not be easy to achieve. Meanwhile, the Haskanita attack is expected to be the last nail in the coffin of what has become known as the Darfur plight. Mauritanian authorities released Muhammad Ali Amin Wulid Sidi Muhammad after a series of investigations following his release from prison in Guantanamo vindicated him of terrorism charges. Wulid Sidi Muhammad confirmed to Al Alam Television that he had been tortured and humiliated during the six years he spent in Guantanamo. Finally, Mohammed al-Amin, Mulad Sidi Mohammed, has returned to his family and relatives here in their modest home in the capital of Nuwakshia. Happiness is reflected on the face of this young man, who is assigned the number 404 during his six years at the horrible Guantanamo Bay prison. 
Torture was taking place at Guantanamo and it was based on the prisoners' religion. Torture was centered on ridiculing our religion because they could not find another way to psychologically affect my brother, prisoners and myself. Although America speaks about the values of justice and democracy, its soldiers and investigators tortured Muhammad al-Amin and other prisoners who were assigned numbers that replaced their names. In this notorious prison, conditions of humiliation and torture did not even spare the most sacred. With deep sadness, not one or two months would go by without the Quran being desecrated right in front of our eyes. The same is true about prayer. Many people were mocked while they prayed and even sometimes banned from praying. We rely on God, who is the best to rely on. The happiness of the family of the former Guantanamo detainee fills this house. However, the families of other detainees wait for reassuring news about their loved ones. We thank everyone who helped to release Muhammad Al-Amin. We ask them to continue their efforts to free the rest of the prisoners, including Muhammad Abdul Aziz and Muhammad Dur Is Salahi. Before he was handed over to his family, the Mauritanian security forces carried out an intense investigation of Muhammad Al-Amin that focused on pinning down his identity, especially since he had never been to Mauritania before despite the fact that both of his parents are Mauritanian. Relatives of the two prisoners, Muhammad al-Salahi and Abdul Aziz, as well as a group of public agencies and legal institutions, are exerting their efforts to put pressure on the Mauritanian government to appeal to the U.S. authorities, which alleged that Nouakchott does not care about its prisoners in Guantanamo. Muhammad al-Amin spent nearly six years behind bars in the notorious Guantanamo prison. He now enjoys his freedom among his family members here in Nouakchott. Meanwhile, the remaining heartbroken Mauritanian families, whose sons remain in Guantanamo, wait for the return of their loved ones as soon as possible. Mohammed Abdallah Amin, Al Alam, Nouakchott. Six years after American forces began fighting the Taliban in Afghanistan, new figures have been released showing the violence there is worse than ever. Hamish MacDonald reports. Twelve people died on Tuesday morning when a suicide bomber attacked a police bus in western Kabul. Civilians, women and children were among the dead. The attack was the latest in what's become an increasingly common occurrence in Afghanistan. We are seeing uh, an evolution in the tactics uh, that the insurgents are using and this inevitably does have uh, 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 an impact on the civilian uh, population here in Afghanistan. Figures from the United Nations show on average there's been 550 violent incidents every month this year. That's up by more than 100 on the previous year. The number of people dying in these situations also appears to be rising. Figures produced by the Associated Press suggest almost 5,100 people have been killed in the first nine months of this year. It's not the, the, the strengthening of the Taliban, but this is the weakness of the government of Afghanistan. NATO has told Al Jazeera the numbers are irrelevant because they don't reflect success or failure in fighting a counterinsurgency. Clearly, though, more people are dying. For ordinary Afghans, the threat of suicide attacks, roadside bombings and airstrikes are now part of daily life. But while civilian casualties are increasing, they're still far outweighed by the number of Taliban and Al-Qaeda fighters killed by Afghan and foreign forces. The trend here contrasts sharply with Iraq, where casualties have dropped this year. For the Afghan government, this is indeed a worrying sign. Hamish MacDonald, Al Jazeera, Kabul. Hi, I'm Wendy Hanamura, station manager here at Link TV. If you're watching Link right now, I'm guessing that you are a bit of a news junkie. You're not satisfied with the headline news, the narrow lens that you see on the networks. It's for people like you that we created Mosaic. 
Right after 9-11, we knew that Americans needed to know the other side of the story. You need context, perspective, and an uncensored view of what's really happening in the Middle East. Somehow, Mosaic hit a chord. 1,400 episodes later, we are still bringing you the best unfiltered news from 36 broadcasters in the Middle East. Yet Mosaic is in danger. We need to raise $200,000 in the next few months to keep this program on the air through the end of 2007. With your support, I am confident that we can do it. I'm asking you to call Link TV right now at 1-866-485-8848. Or please go online to linktv.org and hit that support button on the home page. Become a sustaining supporter by pledging a monthly credit card donation in any amount that you can, and you can stop at any time. Make it $20 or more per month, and we have the perfect gift for all of you Mosaic fans, the brand new Link TV Official News Junkie t-shirt in women's and men's cut your choice on the back we list all of the international news shows that you find here from mosaic to latin polls to democracy now if you contribute a hundred dollars right now we'll send you a great gift for the new year the 2008 link tv day planner has great notations including the first and the last day of ramadan make it a three hundred dollar donation, tax deductible, I might add, and that we will send you the mosaic pack, including the day planner, the sturdy mosaic tote bag, and we're going to fill it with a grab bag of mosaic staff favorites, one DVD and one book selected by the producers of mosaic. Selections include the great tome by Robert Fisk, The Great War for Civilization, and the Academy Award nominee, Paradise Now. This is a great gift to give to a friend, maybe for the holidays. Get a jump on your shopping with Link TV. And here's a one-stop shopping solution. How about making a powerful $1,000 donation to Mosaic? And we're going to send you every single gift that we are showing during this entire fall fundraising drive. Take a look at just a few of them. That's dozens of books and CDs and DVDs personally selected by us, the Link TV staff. Let us do your shopping and be done for the holidays. Plus, you're going to have the satisfaction of knowing that you kept Link TV commercial free and on the air for another day, not to mention the tax deduction. So there's no time like the present. Take a few minutes to go online at linktv.org or make that call at 1-866-485-8848. Become a supporter of Mosaic right now. Imagine if people around the world, let alone this country, got to see Link TV, the culture of the world. I believe that war would be abolished in the 21st century. Please support your independent, non-profit, non-corporate Link TV, because it is yours. Funding for Link TV programming doesn't come from advertisers or government agencies. We rely on individual donations. And whether they know it or not, these are the people that keep us on the air. So to everyone who stands out to help us bring the world together, thanks. Link TV, watched by audiences, funded by individuals. Individuals, we hope, like you. Here's another way of giving to Link TV. It's one of the very best, we think. Please consider asking for no gifts. 100% of your donation will go to supporting this incredible news show, Mosaic. And consider this, a $100 donation pays for the streaming of one Mosaic intelligence report. $400 will cover the broadcast of one episode of Mosaic. $1,000 will keep Link TV free and independent for another day. Remember, we need to raise $200,000 before the end of 2007 to keep this show on the air. Help us reach our goal. We're getting there. But with your help, I know it's right in reach. Thank you for your commitment to this remarkable network, to this remarkable show, Mosaic. Please make your tax-deductible contribution now when it is needed most. Thanks so much. Mosaic needs your support. Help us reach our goal to raise $200,000 by the end of the year to keep Mosaic on the air. Pledge your gift today at 1-866-485-8848 or linktv.org.
Get more news about the Middle East online at linktv.org slash mosaic. The Mosaic webpage offers a complete archive of Mosaic programs, program transcripts, the Mosaic video podcast, and the Mosaic Intelligence Report, a weekly analysis of the hottest stories from the Middle East. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Thank you. This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.